Miscellaneous County Board Education Work Session for February 24th, 2021. Do I have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Second. And you read it. Pursuant to the general provisions of Article 3-305, I move for the board to meet in closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. We have three, three ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll be back at 5 o'clock. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education Queen Anne's County work sessions for February 24th, 2021. Can we stand for the pledge? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, members, you have the agenda in front of you. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Amen. Second. Okay, any discussion? Well, can Ms. Uh, Wright, could you call a vote? I will. Is this is for the approval of the agenda? Yes, approval okay. agenda. Great, not a problem. Um, Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Spinelli? Aye. Ms. Denny? Aye. 3-0 three, three approves. Okay, uh, we had the minutes of February the 17th open. Has everybody had a chance to look at them? Yes. I have a motion to approve? So moved. Have a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Wright? Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Schipanelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. I have three in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay, under discussion 3-01, therapy travelers contract. Yep, Ms. Towers, you coming forward? Good evening. Good evening. For the record, I'm Vanessa Bass, HR Director. This contract was initially supposed to be on the docket, but unfortunately for us, it went through another county's board meeting last night. That person was approved, so our opportunity to grab that person has since dissipated. She took a job with another county to make it short and sweet. Mm -hmm. That's pretty short. Sure. We're asking you. to remove, remove so this. So we will have we have a vacancy for this position now. You you do have a vacancy in those positions. They have been on the HR report the last couple of months. Okay, it's so, a sped position. So you're 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 back. Of looking. course, I have it up. Um, I will tell you that Mrs. Smith is always recruiting, always interviewing. Understand. But special ed, as you know, is a difficult critical area to fill. Are we, are we be able to infill into the guy? I know it's we're behind, but are we it, it, we're meeting our requirements as far as special ed? What needs to be done with this as far as other people filling in or something? So and that's not sustainable what okay. we're doing. So even Mrs. No, I'm not asking. Yeah. I'm not asking to delay this. I'm just saying we are meeting our requ legal requirements for the, the special ed so students at the moment. At the moment, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not questioning that we shouldn't do this. I'm just questioning that we're fulfilling our obligations to our students. Right now, as far as I know, we are in compliance. Okay. So we'll tape, we'll table this thing. Hopefully Thank hear you. from you next time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Moving on. 3-02 Clay Target Team. Good evening, board members. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen, Interim Chief Operating Officer. The update that I have is short. We continue with the Clay Target team to work through our insurance questions and requ requirements. Um, and with that, I can open it to any questions. I believe you've all had the latest information that we have. Yeah, we've discussed it, and I had your last email from Maeve that had some questions and concerns that they wanted to address as we move forward or whatever, if the board decides to move forward. That's correct. So that's where we are still yes. looking into that, addressing those issues. Yes. Okay. Any board members have any other questions? No, I've seen the emails too. Thank you. I would okay. like to make a motion. 
Uh, we're, we're, that, that, it could, yeah. be, a, it okay. could be an item for, uh, if we're going to make a motion on it, I think it could be under action items on number four. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 3-03, opening of schools. Update, Earl. Um, so, so <laughs> we haven't had much for our B-Day students <laughs> with Little the snow. weather uh, right exactly last week. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get them in tomorrow and Friday. They have been very, very patient. But uh, we have visited some schools and, and the kids that we have seen have been um, adjusting quite well. They're happy to be back in schools. Everything is, is operating as it should in terms of uh, meals, uh, meal services, transportation, PPE, everybody has what they need to have. As you know, I've been working, um, having conversations with principals with regard to the full day hybrid schedule or, or a proposed full day hybrid schedule. Mm -hmm. And the consensus is that we are unable to do it. Uh, with the staffing that we currently have and the space in some of the schools. I'll give you for example, so Queen Anne's County High School, they could have some students in the cafeteria, not all that they would need to give teachers their, their 30 minutes duty-free lunch, but they wouldn't be able to put their other students in the gym because classes are going on. So, it, and it's that kind of a scenario throughout. Uh, so some could try to make it work. There, have, there were concerns, I think I mentioned this last time with regard to uh, the number of, of times kids interact and, and the cohorts mixing. You know, that, that could just be something that we deal with. But what we are unable to deal with is the space and the duty-free lunch for teachers. Just, I mean, an idea. Like the high school, how many lunch, do they have run two cycles, three cycles? Um, I think they run three cycles for lunch. Three cycles mm -hmm. for lunch? Some are even more than that. Mm -hmm. So we can get up to four or five, depending on the influx of students in a particular year. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking half our, at the most is half our students are in school, A, B. So, le, so it'd be less than half, not at the maximum be half. But they still have their schedule. They still have their schedules, right. Is there any way, and it's, I mean, certainly your prerogative and the, um, hopefully the principals come up with ideas. If you had three lunch systems, could you go to four? You know, have that half hour lunch to have the students, you know, so we keep our social distancing and stuff like that. And possibly, and as a, at this, and it might be a tough decision, the teachers, or I'm sorry, the principals make some decisions and maybe pulling a, a class, a teacher out of a class and have them solely be on lunch for four shifts or three shifts or two shifts. We don't, we don't have that luxury. Uh, teachers are hired to teach. They do have duties, but they well, are they have duties, but what I'm just thinking, I'm just... And, 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 and the student schedules dictate that. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't pull a teacher from a class so that she could go, or he, go do lunch duty. Where would those children be taught? Well, I'm just thinking maybe a class that... All classes are necessary, but some class that, we, we, if since we're in an exceptional time with trying to get students back in school, could we, make, and I, I'll probably get chastised for this, but maybe a PE or a uh, dance teacher, or and I'm not picking any certain one, but just that'd be certainly your prerogative, but is there any way we could get it, you know, we wouldn't offer that for a semester because we want to open schools for a longer period of time. Does that have any merit to it? Well, teachers and students have a schedule, mm -hmm. and their schedule is what their schedule is. So we can't reschedule the school at this point to have lunch duties. Yeah. I was trying to think outside. You know, just, it, I mean, it seems like our hold up is lunch way. duties is, is the big thing that's holding us up. And space. And space. But lunch would be all right if we had more, you know, if you had three lunch systems, you might have four. You start lunch at 11 o'clock and run to 1.30. That'd be give you a half hour, five lunch periods. That would be considering no teachers or, or te I mean, it's 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 not a um, compartmentalized issue. Uh -huh. It's a compound issue. So there's the issue of space, yes. There's the issue of staffing, mm -hmm. absolutely. And yeah, if you wanted to space it out over time, there's the issue of time. Where are you gonna get these staff from to do lunch duties when they're teaching? They well, that, 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 I'm, and if you say we can't do it, I understand, I mean, I, I, I understand that, but I was just thinking if we could pull a teacher from somewhere, if we had one. I mean, if we don't have one, maybe some schools can make it work. But I mean, I understand too, we have to have every system, especially in the bus tier, work on the same thing because you know we because they're all interact. And then you'd have an issue if one school can't do it and the other one can. Mr. Smith, week after week, I give you the report, Ms. Bass gives you the report with the situation we're in with teachers. 
and we don't have teachers to cover classes. I certainly don't have teachers to cover lunch duty. I, I, I understand. I'm just tr trying to find a way to get students back into school longer. That's all. If we, we can. We've got to be sensible about it, and we have to make sure that it's something that we can do. Okay. And parent volunteers, that's out of the question? It's not out of the question, but it doesn't change the fact that where are we going to put them? And we certainly aren't going to have one high school duty. do it and another high school not. I mean, for lunch duty. If That's you have... exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> right. Is there a call out for parent volunteers or? There's not a call out for parent volunteers. No, we generally don't do that. Um, I mean, generally we want don't. To, but... Right. But if any parent wants to volunteer to do something, they in normal times, they contact the school. In COVID times, we are trying to limit the number of people. We aren't having visitors come in schools. Yeah, but not as visitors, as, as volunteers that can do lunch duty, you know, it's the same people thing. on the, on the, uh, it's the same thing. We're talking about um, cohorts, right? But we're talking about COVID too. And if, you know, people need to come in to get the kids back in school full time, cause they're only like, like I mentioned before, they're only going technically for one full day each week, each, uh, you know, A and B group with a half day schedule. So, and, you know, again, it comes back to Ms. Forbes' report really bothers me that 33% you know, of our ninth graders are getting D's and E's in, in math. I mean, this is unprecedented. So if we can put a call out to parents, you know, on the internet, whatever it is, and, and have them volunteer, can they come in to relieve the teachers on lunch duty so the teachers can have their half hour, you know, in the class or keep teaching in the class, um, whatever it takes. What about, and as far as space goes, do we have any kind of mobile? I know we were talking last time for the uh, during the budget. Um, what are they called? Not the the portable classrooms. Portables. Are they all being used at this time, or are there some that are available to relieve the all of our six foot distance? But we could use if we, and I believe there are some people now that are volunteering, and I, I saw that there were some uh, uh, parents who were doing that. So if they were in the classroom, because I know that space is an issue, so if the parent volunteers are in the classroom, would that teacher be able to stay in the classroom still being duty free, or could they go someplace else for their 30 minutes duty free if there was a volunteer in the classroom? Well, I would, you know, we'd have to find out what the teacher's preference would be. Okay. But that would count as duty free if they stayed there and they weren't being bothered, for lack of a better phrase. If they wanted to do that, that could still count as their duty free or they could travel someplace outside their classroom and that would count. So what would need to happen is we talked a little bit about this last time. We need to have that parent volunteer in a place where there is another certificated employee. Right, so we can't just put a parent volunteer by themselves in places secluded with children. What they need to be mm -hmm. with another certificated person. It's not a substitute, it's a volunteer. There's a difference. So how, what does it take to be certificated? A, a degree. But so a substitute wouldn't be able to stay with them? A substitute absolutely could. But they don't have to have a degree if they only need the 48 hours. Substitutes do have degrees. AA, remember it's the AA. So they're counting that as an AK, all right. That's 48 credits is a AA. Okay, okay. And, and remember, volunteers have to go through background mm -hmm. checks. Right, right. 65, 62.50, and probably a top urine test. So, just, so it's not like you open it up to volunteer and they show up tomorrow or the next day. They still gotta go through background mm -hmm. checks. Okay. Okay. Just so, so they know. Right. So anybody background check 48 hours and they could be a volunteer in the lunchroom. You were talking about a sub. That's for a substitute. Well, no, I mean, if they, but if they have the 48 hours and they have a background check. Volunteers don't need 48 hours. No, I understand that. But I'm saying if you got some volunteers and they were 48 and they had 48 hours, so in essence they're AA, and they volunteered to do a background check, would they be able to cover the classroom? I mean, the lunchroom, classroom, whatever, wherever people were eating. So, so, so then what you're, they'd want to be hired as a sub because you're, what we're talking about is the requirements for a sub. A volunteer doesn't have to have that. And I understand that what you're asking is if a volunteer did have that, mm -hmm. could they stay in, if we hired them as a sub. So it's, there's a difference to be in our employ and to be a volunteer. So if the situation doesn't change, we're gonna be right here in September with no 
uh, volunteers with background checks. So we're just going to keep the, the status quo. Is the volunteer, the nothing? volunteer requirements have been the same, COVID, pre-COVID, and, and so forth. So that doesn't change right. with the volunteer. Right. I don't know, nor do you, where we'll be in September. Sure, exactly. But what I don't want to do is say, no, 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 we can't do anything and let's not do anything. Well, I think and anything is, comes, is relative. You know what? We didn't do anything. I, I think anything is relative oh, because sure. our principals okay. have certainly done something and they have gone back and they met with their teams and they've tried to come up with schedules. But I'm not going to have one high school that can do it and one high school that can't. Those high school children at Kent Island, some of them travel to center, um, to Queen Anne's for some of their courses. Sure. Some of them are doing virtual courses together. Mm -hmm. So I can't have one high school doing it and another. I got about half of my middle schools that could probably do something, risking you know the, the six feet social distancing, but the other two, we just can't make it work. So I can't have half of our students doing it and the other half that can't. What about going down to three foot distancing? Now, I know the recommendations are six foot, but if it takes a half an hour or 20 minutes for a lunch period for the kids to go to three foot distance, hypothetically, if we did that, they eat lunch, they get their mask back on, and then they're back at six feet distance in the room and you know, with the plexiglass up and everything else, um, would that create enough space if we were to do that? Well, I'm not at liberty to do that. And I, I think I maybe you would want to talk to Dr. Ciotola and the powers that be with regard to that. So I'm yeah, not well, even I, I know Dr. Ciotola's position on it. Yeah, but and I'm mine asking as you well. as, a, as a practical matter, as a physical question, if we went down to three feet, would there be enough room that we wouldn't have to think about using the gym or anything else that teachers could get their half hour lunch because we'd have the kids in the lunch room under supervision and uh, they eat their lunch, you know, they're at three foot distance and then 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they, they move back to class. I can't definitively say yes without doing some work on that. All right, but fair enough. And you've gone out to the principals, which, you know, you've, you, you, you as superintendent's in charge of it, but to super, the principals at each school have to make it work. Have they all collaborated to come up with different ideas too? I've had work, different ideas working, from different I mean, principals. working together as a team, saying, you know, this might work, and I each, each school is a little different, little physical setups and stuff like that, I understand, but, you know, as they all collaborate enough to say, okay, these are our roadblocks, here's how I got by them, Here, I, okay, can I do this? Maybe I can't, but maybe, and I just, I just hope we collaborative all work together because I think the sooner we can get back and the more time kids, students can spend in the classroom, the better off we are. And I think you agree with that. Absolutely. Um, and, and so do the principals and so do the that, teachers. That's what I think so the board's really... I, I don't want you to... Um, because what tends to happen at these meetings is it becomes uh, the board against Dr. Kane it's or the, the board against teachers. And, and I don't want to set, continue that scenario. What you need to know is that teachers, principals, their leadership teams absolutely are collaborating. They absolutely have gone to task and done what I I asked them to do just like you asked me to go and see if we can make it work for full day they have gone with their team so I don't want it to be misunderstood that our teams aren't doing anything or that they aren't collaborating or that they aren't working to see if they can make it work well, because they are I, I am not incentive that at all and it's not in my opinion to board with dr. Kane or to board with the principals it is. that's your opinion it it is. Certainly, I, I want to yeah. work with you if I can but when we, you know, we don't talk to principals. You, you, that's your job. Well, some of you do. I don't talk to principals. If some of them do, but no, nobody, I don't think, is given. If, if somebody's, you're in charge of the thing. That is correct. And I have no problem there. All I'm asking is, and I think different board members come at different ways, is we keep working to try to get this resolved, if we can. And it, and right now you're telling us it's, it's somewhere not suitable. But we just, we keep working at it because we've got, Three more months until June comes at the end of this school year. It's we're, we're tomorrow going to be March. I mean, we're right around the corner in the March, so we're talking three months. 
I just, I just want. I think these kids need the opportunity to get back in schools, as, if we can safely and work it out, and and do everything we can. I'm not saying you're not doing it. I'm not saying that. I know the principals hopefully are, and you're working with them to get it all together. I'm just trying to collaborate and get and get ideas. And it's it's certainly don't get offended that you know we're trying to sit there and do something as possible. We're just asking. And know? and I recognize that that you're just asking, and I keep telling. <laughs> well, and so we're going to keep asking. So don't, so don't, so don't, so don't be asking. offended when I keep telling you. I'm not offended. Okay, good. But I'm going to keep because, asking. Uh, but, but I'm so going to keep telling you. Okay. So. Well, but, but don't keep. But if, but if we can work it out, just because we can't do it today, doesn't mean we can't do it. Tomorrow. And that's what you're not hearing me say is that our principals and leadership teams have gone back. Okay. They have gone back. And I don't think that you're hearing me say that. I'm hearing you. It's just I'm just trying to resolve every avenue that we can. That's sort of questions we're asking you because you're the you're the superintendent. That's who we ask to do this kind of thing. That's correct. Um, and I think one of the things I'm seeing is the state has mandates, and I, I certainly will say Dr. C because I got my second shot the other day. He's very very adamant about sick distancing. So I don't think that's going to change any in the next week or two because of what's going on. Hopefully, maybe in a month things could change to something. And if it does, are we ready? If we could go down like. Mark suggested, the three feet. Would that thing, would we have a plan in place? Okay, we're down to three feet. Now we can think we can make this work or something. That's all I'm asking. Yes. So what happens is if, if, if we get direction that we can go down to three feet, our teams, some of our teams already have schedules that they can propose. And, and some of them, I just talked to another principal today to say that she could if we got down to where we didn't have to consider physical distancing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that, that's what I want to get across to you is that principals are working. They are trying to comply with what we ask, but when they can't do it, they have to say they can't do it. And I have to let you know that. I, so when things change, if things change, whenever things change, then they'll be ready. We still have, we still need two weeks, just as for the public, we still need two weeks to run bus routes. We need to make sure that we are stocked with food. So our food services still has to order food and make sure that they're prepared for more students in the schools. So there's a little preparation that has to be done um, in terms of what we're going to do with the students who elect to continue to work at home virtually. We have to make sure that we're still set up for that because remember it, some of our students are going to continue to be home mm -hmm. so we've got to give teachers some time to prepare for that because they'll have their full day i got to make sure that they get their planning their lunch duty-free lunch and then they'll have to plan for kids that are at home as well as kids that are in school maybe i'm missing something <clears throat> but all i was asking was instead of going but you'd be the A, just keep the A B thing, half students. We just you'd be in school longer. You would be there the full you know, full day rather than a half day. So to me the buses just instead of coming at one o'clock would come at three o'clock and that's just a general thing. And the food, we're getting them grab and go bags anyway, so the food's already there for everybody to get a meal. It, to me it sounds like it's staffing, distancing, big issues that are gonna be the problem. Yeah, no, and, and they do have to prepare for the food. They absolutely do. Mm -hmm. um, we've had this conversation and if Ms. Pulling can come forward if she likes, but they do have to prepare for the food and make sure that they're ordered properly. And we do have to go back for bus routes. Yes, we do, because we're gonna go back once again and say to parents, do you want your child to come back now, right? Because there are some that are not here that may decide that they wanna come back if there is a full day schedule. Well. It, 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 the buses need to know where to go. Well, that, that would be an interesting question. That's something maybe the board, because, I mean, the, 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 the students that signed up for in-school learning for the half day, pick that option. And I thought we were kind of maybe not clear enough. You pick what you want to do, and that's how it's going to go the rest of the year. But if we change, if we change our schedule. We're not, all, we're we doing, say, all we're doing is adding time to the that's day. That's a change in the schedule. That is absolutely a change in the schedule. That's a change in student schedule. And it's a change in teacher schedule. So we do have to go back and we do have to say to parents, would you now like your child to come to school all day? We do have to plug those homes into the bus routes so the bus driver knows, okay, now make this stop, this stop, that stop. So it's not just as if we can say, you know, let's just add on two more hours to the day. It is absolutely not that simple. So you would you would feel that if we go to two, two hours in a day, that we would have to reboot and give every parent another choice to see if they want to come back to the school. Absolutely. Okay. Gotcha. Dr. Kane, can you check with your principals to see if we were to go through th two, three feet distance, um, whether that would satisfy the space requirements in their individual schools? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Any other questions by the board? No. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, I'm sorry. since we're on the subject, um, vaccines, uh, do we have a new number on vaccines or? They're being given out as we speak. I think they ended at five at Sutherlandsville this, um, this, this evening. Okay. But I don't know how many will be given out until I get a report from the health department. So our last number was, was 337, I think, that yeah. had been vaccinated. That's what I meant, yeah. And nothing last week due to weather. And this week, I sent out the links on Monday. They're getting them now. Which, in the northern location, as a matter of fact, for those people. Is your feel, let's get, I know we're limited how many we can get. Is your feel it's getting better? I know last week with the, the snow and the weather hurt us, but are we getting more wrapped up as far as, I know as we get closer to the end of people wanting to get vaccinated, it should be better. I hope it is. As far as t times are getting in there and being able to get appointments. We get 100, we, we, we get the 100. Um, and the bus drivers have to get some based on tears and age. It's the only mm -hmm. time I'm smiling about age. And, <laughs> I'm with you. And also um, in person, face to face. But we are, last week was the only week, weather out of our control. This week, Monday, like clockwork, we got the link. I sent it out. So whoever got on the computer first, they're in there. And I'm sure Ms. Morset, maybe that's where she is. Mm -hmm. She will, oh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Um, <laughs> that she will be able to let you all know something possibly later on this evening. Well, I don't, I, well, I, I, yeah, she, I mean, she's a board member, but that's her job. That's right. separate from this board. So that's right. public, it, some's public information, some's not. So Numbers I don't, I, are, all, are fine. I don't want to, I don't want to put her in that position. I can say that. I just okay. can't say Yeah, that. I just, yeah, just want to know. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're, we're in a positive direction. Okay. Any other questions? Not me. Okay, moving on, 3-04 budget review. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, and board members. Tonight we are looking at different budget scenarios. Before we get started, I'd like to bring to your attention the two handouts that were on your table. The first one is a different scenario, six of them. And then the second handout actually ties out to the different scenarios. So you'll see a number at the corner and that'll tie out to each individual scenario that we go through. That, that's the one you should, we got, this one right here, right? Yes, that scenario, scenario. And then you have a handout that looks like this Today? as well. Yes. Look underneath the, what's underneath the, uh, not under the book, but under the clipped pack. There you go. Gotcha. I wanted to make sure everybody had their Thank you, right in front of me. Before we get started, Sorry. Thank we're going to dive in here. And you said there's a number in the corner on which one? The, um, on on, the, on other. the one that says Kerwin up top. Yeah, which one? Um, there's a number here that's what says one. Oh, bottom, all right. And that'll tie out to right. each individual one on here so you can see the work paper okay. on how we calculated that. So before we get started, just a basic overview. Over the last year, many school systems in the state of Maryland, as you know, saw a decrease in their 930 counts, us being 334 students. Um, as a result, the um, FY22 major fund programs um, were impacted. The blueprint fund for a future, I'm sorry, Maryland Future Program included two grants that were called Hold Harmless. One was a declining enrollment and the other one was for transportation. And this netted to a $3 million um, allocation towards us. Now the proposed Maryland legislation, Senate Bill 933, is contingent upon the county appropriation that they are um, match plus one dollar basically to the same amount of funding. So um, just want to let you know that this is all contingent upon the governor's passing of his bill. In, in these scenarios, we're going to look at fund balance and we're going to look at ESMIC health care trust. Now these should only be used for one-time purposes. In this case, because we saw such a, a swing and decrease, I could argue that this is the time because we, the hopes is in, in um, September that, that we're, we're going to see those, those students come back. So it is a one-time 
gap to get us where we need to be. And that's really what fund balance and any reserve balances tend to be for, or a huge spike in any health care costs or things like that. With, with the state gonna hold us harmless for decreasing enrollment? Our enrollment only will go back, that, that number's in there for 7,700 kid ch students or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're down two or 300. They're gonna hold us, if we use that fund balance, the, all, the, plus that, in that double dipping? Our, the fund balance is actually Queen Anne's County Public Schools fund balance mm -hmm. and not the state's. Understand, but ha next year, our student enrollment goes back up to 77. Okay. We're already being paid for 77 this year, aren't we, with the GAP grant? Um, they'll adjust the hold harmless grants. So instead of seeing the three million under hold harmless, you'll see a decrease. So they'll they'll make the adjustment on their side as far as the state allocation. Is that what you're referring to? Because the once they make a decrease, how do we get our since if if we subsidize with one time money, how do we? I mean, I just I see it's it's going to be a reoccurring cost to us. That's my only concern. Well, and and that's a good point. So um, with with fund balance, you you definitely want to for one time only. However, with the state. Um, when you see the decrease in declining enrollment, they, they will have grants and incentives because they don't want any one school system to be at a negative impact. They will always want to see growth. So if we go back up to what you were, what you were saying as far as if we increase in enrollment, will our state dollars increase or are you asking if our county dollars because we have two basic funding well, sources? Our, our, our that could be a county question, but my, st my state question concerns me is we're down, I'm, I'm just for the sake of argument, 300 students. Yes. So we should be down state money because we don't have as many students. The state's going to say they're going to hold us harmless, give us the same amount of money because it's an odd year and all this. Okay, so we got this much money because you now, the 300, we're going to pay you for, even though you don't have them, we're going to hold you. So next year they go back up. Well, they're going to already say, I paid you that 300, so you're not going to get any more. If we use that million or whatever dollars out of the other thing, do our budget this year, do it, won't we need to do it next year too? It, potentially, potentially, yes. But however, when you look at the, there's two different buckets from the state that we're seeing. You're seeing your foundation funds and then you're seeing your um, blueprint funds. So if our enrollment increases, our blueprint funds will decrease. So that's where the adjustment will be made on that end, on the state end. So it wouldn't be considered double dipping on the state end. Okay. Um, can we bring up the PowerPoint? Should we bring up the PowerPoint or? Yes. Yep. So the first scenario this evening, if you look at scenario one, it will say Kerwin MOE, one step for employees and one step at the top. On the left hand side, you can see that the Kerwin MOE is 62,200,000. There is a one beside it, you can see the work paper. This is actually was uh, given to us as a projection for future years with the county. Number that, that, that Kerwin 62 is accounting in us more money than last year. Uh, correct. And I'm going to try to make this larger too. And the question I also, when it says step for all employees, that's the ones that are on step. Correct. And then we have a 1% at the top. The, what about the ones that got the step? Are they getting a percent too? Not in this scenario. Okay, they're just getting a step. No, and I, I do want to make a point yes. too. Um, this right here is just strictly for draft scenarios. We're still in negotiation process. Are we? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, there's there, there's no, just as in prior years, we use a step and a percent as a placeholder. And what you'll see in the various scenarios, just like normal, and for the new board members, is we switch it around, so we play around with the numbers. If we paid a step and a percent, and a percent for those at the top of the scale that don't get steps anymore, it would cost this amount. If we paid one step, it would cost this amount. If we gave 2% to those at the top of the scale, it would we don't have an, 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 um, an agreement at this point. So we give you scenarios. And all of this, regardless, is absolutely contingent upon and agreed upon uh, a, um, a negotiated agreement and funding. Okay. Because we we bargain in good faith, Correct. both, both the, the association and the board. Correct. And then it's depending on the funding, if it's not fully funded, then we have to make some hard decisions, which Correct. we've made in the past. Correct. So right now, this is just a placeholder of a, of a general number and with different scenarios. Nothing's been nothing's been agreed upon on anything yet. And then it's then after it's agreed upon, then it's also in good faith both both parties if it's funded. Correct. Okay. And then this uh, on the state side is contingent upon the governor's budget passing with with no um, changes to as well. Right. So the next line item you'll see is 32,654,437. That's work paper two. That's that foundation funds that we were speaking to. Underneath that is your state blueprint funds, your unrestricted portion. And this is where we see underneath here the declining enrollment grant of the 3 million and the disabled transportation grant of 45,000. The next one here under revenue is your non-public placement for other sources. And of note, it's 200,000 and it's been budgeted 200,000 in prior years. So we kept that the same with underneath, we wanna to propose to increase it another 250,000 to match actual costs. Because non-public placements runs about 52% is what we get reimbursed from the state on. So um, the non-publics have been running about 918,000. The next one under other funding, 440, that's going to be your miscellaneous revenue. And then if you add those up on your unrestricted, it's $99,499,049. The projected restricted revenue, um, right now we're gonna keep it as the same for last year because we're still in the process of applying for grants. We don't know exactly what that number is gonna be. So that's at that 7.3. Underneath projected revenue, the last line item there is fund balance. And this is where, when we talked about using that one-time money, our fund balance, if you um, look at page six, under our worksheets, you will notice that unassigned, we have 2.3 in fund balance. Now, my memory, we used fund balance last year to balance our budget. But we, we actually budgeted for it, but it was not used. The next page. Let me ask you one other question. Of course. And just to, and it's not, I mean, it, I know this is all hypothetical right now. When there's other funding, tuition and building use, that could vary quite a lot if, and, I mean, building use certainly hadn't been used this year. We haven't rented them out. And, and exactly. And so. next year, hopefully we're back on 100% September the 1st, but if, if we stay any kind of social distancing, I mean, and priorities, it, it, our buildings might not be able to be used for public use, I would think. But, and we could see a shortfall in the revenue in that, in that So I mean, that could be another mm -hmm. thing to item to consider, okay. especially as the year goes along. Yes, those receipts. So you asked me about if we've, um, we've budgeted for fund balance in the past 200, 250,000. On the next page, you'll see um, the audited financial statements for FY20. It has a six on the corner as well. If you look down to the to um, total expenditures and encumbrances at 2.3, so right there is a favorable increase or a favorable between what was budgeted for your expenses and what was actually used. <clears throat> However, you can see at the top where it says total revenues of 585,634. We actually were under 
I mean, we're over budgeted there. So you have to net those two. So we were actually under budgeted for our revenue, so we're short on our revenues and our expenses, we actually saved money. If you net the two, you come out with 1.7 million available awesome. in, the, in the positive that could go towards fund balance. However, if you take a look down below, you see how it minuses out that fund balance because we didn't end up using it, so it netted it out. So what we brought into fund balance in FY20 is that 1.4. But that we don't expect that. I mean, this year we didn't. We weren't open a lot. I mean, it was. A, I mean, luckily, we, I'm not luckily. We saved money and didn't. You know, with all the grants and COVID money and stuff like that, subsidize some of our other costs. Exactly. So some of some of the savings that you see was um, services in it's March. Not normal, not, it's not a normal year. Right. Exactly. From March on, we realized some savings there as well. So that rolls through that 1.4 to our beginning balance, a fund balance, to leave us at an unrestricted at 2.3. On the next side here, we start off with FY21 expenditures that were budgeted. So what was budgeted was 98,283,128 for unrestricted and restricted 7,376,465. Now, from there, we, we look at do we, what do we build on and what can we um, deduct to match our revenue? Because we have our revenue number there set at the bottom left-hand corner under, under where it says projected revenues at 107525514 So we have to take a look at that and, and look at our expenditures and get that difference to zero because we, we balance our budget. So if we look at the total factors that are increasing the budget in this scenario, if we just look at one step and you have that work paper nine, and we talked about it in previous meetings, that one step was 1.6 million in estimated cost. And that's just for a step Correct. based on this year's salary. Correct. And then the next line item, the 1% of employees at the top is projected at 202,515. The next one is request from the schools at 253,160, and we can drill down to that. That's actually 11 on our work paper. Um, when we went over a couple weeks ago, each school had different requests that we presented as, as well as the supervisors and departments. And at the initial request, if you look at work paper 11, totaled 806,000. 835. So under work paper 11, we can dive into that detail. So what we're proposing tonight is out of that 816,835 to, to bring it down to 253,160 to help balance the budget. We're looking at other funding sources for these opportunities. Would you like me to go line by line, or do you have any questions on any of those lines? Um, you've, you've seen them before on those requests. We're just trying to look at bare bones, what, what um, we need to get in this budget in order to be compliant with different areas. And this is one scenario. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, <laughs> and this, Cutting this down, Dr. Kane, that's your, I mean, I mean you're the one that sits there and says, this is, if we're going to cut something, these are the ones we need to cut. These ones we are, are higher up. I mean, with exec teams, mm -hmm. and we prioritize. Sometimes it's a case where can we get what the person is, the, te the principal is asking for from another funding source. And sometimes we can. Uh, or if, if, it just depends. Mm -hmm. Is it something that has to wait another year? Is it something that we can get in a, from another funding source? We just look at the various options there. And after the budget cycle and everything's approved, we'd like to go back to the different departments with their funding requests and go over line by line of uh, where it was funded, um, what opportunity, other opportunities we're looking for, and um, to provide them the feedback on each of their requests. 
So you go back to the, to the principals and the people that fund us and say, here's what we think we can do, here's what we can't do, and can we do it work another avenue on we it? We actually don't go back until we have approved a budget. Okay. Right. But, but right they now. They know. They'll they, know. Mm -hmm, when if, they, need, if they see this, they're going to know you're, something's correct. been either left in and it could still be taken out or something has been already taken out. Correct. Or we've already gotten it in a different way. Okay. And sometimes uh, we wait until you know fourth quarter to look at what savings we have to see if we can fund things that way. Me, when you say okay. So even though sometimes we say no with the request for the budget, mm -hmm. there's another way that we can get it. It just depends on what it is, the cost. Exactly, and if it's a one-time um, cost or if it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. Try to use but I mean, when I, for when I see cost. kindergarten teachers and fourth grade teachers, they're not one time cost and they're the bigger numbers. Right. But one thing that we've worked hard on is we've taken a look at en enrollment and by school and, and as well as teacher and to see the allocation students per grade too as well. We've, we've, we've looked at that and um, tried to see if there's any possible savings there or maybe shifting. And I think we're, we're still in the process of trying to identify some, but there's maybe a couple positions that we can um, have reallocated. And we're basing all this on that our enrollment will be the back to this. We'll get our, I'm mean, not saying we'll get all our 300 students back or 250, whatever the number is, but we're basing it on that, not that we're down. So we, we look at projected enrollment mm -hmm. and we also listen to what the principals are telling us right now. Okay. So in some schools, um, a good number of students have returned and in some schools not. But if we go back th this year or September to normal, where we have a regular full day, five days a week, we're basing it on opening schools, funding opening schools 100% the way we were a year ago, a year and a half ago. I can't say 100% the way we were a year and a half ago, no. I mean, what I'm we saying. look at projections, and, and it's going to be somewhere between where we are now and where we should be in a normal year. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I'm just thinking most, once we get back to, I mean, students have left to go to private schools that are open. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping, and I know our system, I'm hoping the parents that have sent them somewhere else, when we get back to being able to be there full time, and I say full time, I'm talking five days a week, full day, as normal, um, that you know we will get our, our students who have confidence to come back to our school. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. And I wanna make sure we have the resources to take care of that. That's that, you know, if we're planning for that. Well, why don't you hear the rest of the scenarios? Okay. This is one. So why don't you hear the rest of the scenarios and, and see where we end up? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and and what we've seen historically in the past, probably as you know, is the fluctuation has been plus and minus five, six students. Nothing like what we've seen this past year for COVID. In addition to the budget request, we have the hourly wage adjustment for minimum wage. Now, this is also dependent upon law. I think there's proposed legislation to increase it to $15 an hour. As of today, I don't think it's increased yet to that amount. It's been progressively increasing. So we have to take that into account too for our hourly wages. So that's that place marker of 32,000. It, it, it will affect anybody that's, let's say it goes to 15. It would affect anybody making less than 15. But, right. it, but then it would also probably have a ripple effect to people making 15, 50, 16, 17, because I mean, proportionally, I don't know where you stop and where you start that number, but you know, if the person goes from 10 to 15, the person at 15 would love to go to 20, but I don't know if they get that far, but you know, I mean, just. Right, um, we have a committee that meets and talks about this and okay. the percentage increase, we try to be fair across the, the board and of course not having that huge increase, but just something that's reasonable and we talk over line by line on each one of yeah. those. Okay, so the total factors increasing the budget on the uh, salary scenarios, proposed scenarios, as one step and 1%, those budget requests, the hourly wage increase, and then the projected uh, trans uh, projected transportation increase at 133384 If you go to work paper 13,
and this is truly the cost of doing business with transportation for this coming school year we have five buses that are at their 15 year max cycle we have to take into account the difference in the pva from what they're currently getting to what they could be getting projected now be mindful that they can go back to 13 and 14 year as well but he in this budget scenario we're projecting just those 15 year buses there's also uh, some hourly rate changes, mile rate changes that have to go into consideration. You can see the calculations there. So um, you see the increase of 133,384. And this is our coming, this coming year will be our last year of our co agreed contract with the school bus drivers. Yes. I mean, not that it, it's a good thing to have it so everybody knows where they are, but th this is already something that's been agreed upon for, I think it was a three or five year contract, three year contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll have to get negotiate for the 23 school year. Mm -hmm. Yes. The next item here on the main summary page under scenario one is a reduction of one open position and plus retirement savings. We're projecting nine retirements and fill, fill in those at um, a lower rate because of it based upon experience. So we can take a look at that as well. If you look at page one, 14. Dr. Kane, I mean, it's personnel, so it's not something here, but the one opens is just something you feel is not needed in the school system. Oh, no, they're all needed, but it's to balance. We'd have to reduce one just like we did 19 last year to balance uh, that, that, that I know that and that's what concerns me <laughs> when we start balancing a budget by reducing staff that the only way we can get to it aside from the main points that you're seeing on here is the use of fund balance and we're you know we've asked about the health trust to see if we could use those dollars in order to reduce the number of positions that we have to reduce mm -hmm. and that's and that's putting the scenario of our salary improvements too in there mm -hmm. yes it's a placeholder. Yes, and if you look on um, worksheet 14, it'll have that position description there too for your review later on. It's an open position. Okay. And then the, the, there's the worksheet that for the 216,000. Is that kind of standard that it's that the health insurance is approximately 15% extra on top of salary? Do we know? Do we have a percentage range of what? Of what we we normally pay, it, it depends which plan they select. That's really going to be the key. And in a budget scenario, you you tend to want to do the, the family plan because you don't know what they're going to opt for. Because we pay 100%, correct? At 90. Um, it, for the individual. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, the next items here that has to be in consideration for the upcoming fiscal year 22 budget is the furlough day for 21. We have to add that back in at 270,000. There is a variance report from 21. What, remember when we looked at the five-year average, we went line by line on each account that we had listed. And there's a couple adjustments that we have to make. If you look at 15, it details out those adjustments. So under mid-level, we're bringing from instruction the supervisor position at 127384 We're bringing that to mid-level because that's their job duty. Um, a portion of their salary is actually grants too, so we have savings there. There's miscellaneous savings under instruction that we can realize. However, if you look under instruction at 110000 that's for the non-special um, ed student, students for um, psychological services. S special education, the proposed here is consortium. It's 2% increase, as well as getting us to where our current cost is now. So it would have to increase at 132,212. For a non-public, it's 912 or 918. It's budgeted at 485, so we need to bring that up to 433. So the net effect of this is an additional 284,617. On our 
I know we had a furlough day last year, 180, and then we have, what, nine days that we do in, in service? Is that what our contract? Um, yes. And that's in line, I guess, with other school systems and... Mm -hmm. And then the next item, our line item is our ESMIC Healthcare Trust. This proposal is asking to pull from the trust 742,481. On page 16, you'll see the detail of that, of what our current balance is. Now, an item of note that this is consolidated and, sh and shared, um, with, or not shared, but ESMIC combines both the county and the Board of Education into one lump sum. They've been doing that way for years. And this is the total. And this is the total amount. And asking what our current percentage is as far as enrollees for this year, uh, the Bo Board of Education is at 63.8% of the total en enrollees, and then the, the county is the rest. So we're, we're, just for sake of argument, two-thirds or one-third. Correct. So that would be, that's how that money is divided. If it was, as far as allocated, they would have that much, a third of it, we'd have two-thirds of it. I, I, I think we'd probably have to go back and, and, and check as far as do an analysis of But, but it, I'm, I, just, just for sake of argument, yes. if, if you're telling me 63, I go to 66, third, it just me. But it definitely historically, the school system has, has had more, more participants than, than the county, yes. But we pay more, I think. I mean, we pay a higher percentage than the county. Correct. So in, in my brain, we're looking at a fund balance of 650 and pulling health care at, at 74. Correct. So we're looking at, okay, um, this scenario. And this, this is assuming that this is a one-time event that we're going to get back to enrollment numbers. Those 930 numbers are going to be the key in September as far as where we're going to sit in enrollment. So scenario one is the county funding us at that uh, six, 62 million, 62.2 for proposed Kerwin that was um, brought to our attention last year. The one step for all employees and one step at the top, basically. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, that's assuming the county is going to go up above, it's about a million two additional for the county. Yes. And we're pulling out of fund balance and health care trust almost a million four. Yes. Okay. And when, when you think about losing 334 students, that equivalates, let's say it's 13,000 is what you pay a student. You're looking at well over, what, 4.8 million, I think it is, 4.3. Mm -hmm. um, well, three, over we get, three over we get back into declining enrollment grant. Yes, correct. Okay. The next scenario, too. Mouse keeps jumping. Here we go. So for scenario two, staying with if the county was to fund us at Kerwin MOE, one step and 1% for all employees and 2% at the top. So as you can see on the left-hand side, the projected revenue is going to um, remain the same at the 107525514 The projected expenses, the item of note, the projected scenario for salary increase at one step and 1%, you can see that work paper attached, is gonna be a little over 2.3. 2 percent 2 increase of employees at the top of the scale, 405,000. And then a reduction of two open positions and retirement savings to bring into this budget. And then the ESMEC Healthcare Trust uh, pulling from that at 1.5 the balance to the revenue. What, what the Kerwin maintenance of effort, what's the repercussions that the county said, we're not doing it, we're giving you what we gave you last year. Do we lose any money other places? We will, um, if what they, they'll have to give us what they give last year and a dollar in order for us to keep the declining enrollment grant and this disabled transportation grant. But that, that would be the only impact. So, but when it says, 
incur when maintenance of effort. That's just you're just we're using the word "cur" and just to up some of the stuff to keep. Right. It, it was it was labeled on this worksheet, so I wanted to be consistent with okay. what, gotcha. what the county had had given us. Okay. So as you can see on this scenario, if it was one step and 1% and 2% at the top, it's it's pulling from the ESMEC reserve 1.5. The next scenario, scenario three. This is looking at if you, if the county was to fund us $1 over MOE, so we would be in, um, able to obtain those declining enrollment grant and disabled transportation. That's the only thing that changes on that projected revenue side. So you'll see the projected revenue at $106,359,074. So from that, if you look on the right-hand side, your expenses, the salary increase at one step at 1.6, a 1% 1 for employees at the top is at uh, 202,515. When we go down, another item of change would be the potential factors decrease in FY22 budget, which would be a reduction of five positions and re re retirement savings and pulling from the trust 1.5. Last year we used 72,000 as a number for reduction of staff. Is that what we're using this year? Um, if you, uh, we're using 85. If you look on page, I believe it is 11. Um, you know, let me look. It details out that calculation. Uh, page 14, because what we did is we took a look at the average teacher salary, the total amount at the 40, million four hundred fifty four thousand five fifty four divided by a number of teachers and then did the computation that way to get to the 85 so we're, we're, we're okay 85 now so okay but it's also considering health care at the more expensive one too as well dr kane i might have had this wrong but when we do reduction of staff you decide what plan you want to implement as far as who's you know but then doesn't it go by seniority so we go by the negotiated agreement right and the negotiated agreement looks at seniority and certification so if a person does not have an advanced professional certificate and they are um, low in seniority then those uh, employees would be reduced first those positions do we i mean in, in using that scenario do you think that 85 is since they're not i mean when i see this number it's probably ones with the degrees and more more far up in the in the chain more higher in the steps I that's sorry when we lose people it's going to be the the young not the younger the, the less tenured and with less degrees sure. Sure. so so the way miss um towers did it was she took the worst case scenario if you will okay and she looked at full benefits the most expensive just to keep us covered so we may experience some savings it may be a little less than than the 85. But if we but when we get rid of, um, but but it, it might go the other way. If we're losing somebody, we might not be losing eighty five. We might be losing a sixty five. Right. I, I just wanted to do the average. Okay, that's I, the average. I took the average because I mean your hands are tied to the point as far as. It's, you know, you're just not going to say it did, did, did. You, there's, a, there's a formula with the negotiation agreement you've got to go by. Mm -hmm. So you just can't say, wait a second, I'm going to get rid of these three people. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and that's what scares me that it's not going to be the 85. It might be the 65 or 55, mm -hmm. more, closer to it. And when I say that number, it's with benefits. So it's not, you know, all salary, but it's, it's a cost to the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The next one is scenario four. Scenario four. And that's $1 over... I'm getting confused. We're, I'm on four now. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're rolling right <laughs> along here. I didn't even realize it. Okay. <laughs> it's still one dollar over MOE. Yes, okay, we're still at that dollar. Okay. Just some more. Um, under this scenario, too, it's one dollar over M MOE, one step and one percent for all employees and two percent at the top. So you can see here the, the revenue remains the same as in scenario three at the 106, 359.74. Under this scenario, it, we're looking at the one step and 1% at 2.3, the 2% at the top at 405. And in this situation, 
potential decrease that we would have to look at is possible any open positions at 15 and retirement savings in order to balance under this scenario here. Uh, keeping in, in mind the ESMEC Healthcare Trust at that 1,528,384. And the one thing I see, and it's, it's me and one of five, but fund balance is 650, and pulling money out of the uh, trust is 1.5 on all these scenarios to balance this budget. Uh, not all scenarios. If you go back to scenario one. Okay, it's only pulling 642. It's. 742 742 on the first. and 650. Yeah. Yeah, 650 on the fund balance everything. Okay. Uh, on scenario one, it's 742 and the rest of it's a million five. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha, sorry. Okay. Under scenario five, we're looking at the possible worst case scenario. I don't want to be gloom and doom. But I'm going to be for a minute here. If we if we look at work paper 17, if we were funded at maintenance of effort, and this is draft calculations, they haven't even released the forms yet. So draft calculation, we're looking at MOE based upon enrollment at 59, 59,775,303. This is without the grant. Correct. And that's a, one of the other um, big things that you'll see, the declining enrollment grant we want to be eligible for or the disabled transportation grant. So it would bring our projected revenue at 101,374,092. So that's the revenue number that we have to tie to when we look at the expenditure side. So in this scenario, there would um, be nothing available for salary increases, no percent for employees at the top of the scale, uh, reduction of uh, five positions, with some retirement savings. And um, if we do not pull from fund balance, if we do not pull from ESMIC Healthcare Trust, we're, we're looking at a shortfall of 4.6 million. Okay. But, but if we get the, what the county, if they go to the other one would be another million three? Um, it, Correct, that they, for the one dollar over mm -hmm. maintenance of effort, that would you? That'd be a million three over last year. And then if we go with the grant, that's three million if we get that. Mm -hmm. So then we're very close to the 4.6 on this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can work different scenarios however you'd like to um, uh, and get them to you. I mean, if I, you know, to be a lot of decisions to make, and we've always had this. I mean, is this is nothing new. Under scenario six, this looks at looking at a step or looking at 1% mid year and a, a one step across the board and 1% at the top using the projected Kerwin MOE. So this would bring us to on the revenue side, you can see at 107,525,514. And the one step and 1% in January would then be 1.9 projected. And then the 1% increase for um, employees at the top would be 202. A reduction of the one position and a pulling from the ESMIC Healthcare Trust at a little over a million and then pulling from fund balance as well. But if that's, that's, that saves us some money this year, but when we do the 1% in January, it's a reoccurring cost for the following year. So it's right. it's a short-term saving of one year to me. It's just like putting on a fund balance or something. Right, correct. So it's it's the short serv or savings of about 200,000. For one year, but it's not gonna happen next year. Right. It's just a, a difficult time with such a, um, it just seems like a one-time drop in enrollment. Now, looking at the averages from prior years, we just didn't see those types of um, increases and fluctuation. It's always been plus or minus position. But even, even, if, even in a year that you 
or even and gain three or four or lose three or four, when you consider salary increases and things like that, you're in a hole already. If, if we're going to make salary improvements and, and honor steps and do stuff like that, you need major increases in enrollment. And that brings other issues. But I mean, you know, because you're, you're, you're looking at two, two and a half million dollars increase, Every not year. counting other things like fuel and electric and uh, supplies that maybe go up just for inflation reasons. All right. So, I mean, Questions or anything? I guess, well, this is Dr. Kane. We are meeting in March. Our, our next meeting is March the 3rd, and we have two workshops, 10th and 17th. Uh, we were with the commissioners April. What? We're, they want the budget by them to April the? April 6th. 6th. Mm -hmm. And we meet on April 7th. They want it on that. 6th is a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. They want the budget uh, on the 6th. So we're looking at having our budget done and approved no later than the right at this current time march 17th for this board so everybody needs to keep an eye on that um, we've been in talks with with the county and mm -hmm. we're meeting with them on monday um, i'd like to review the scenarios with them mm -hmm. too as well so that they can kind of um, see where what we're looking at where we are too as well and um just, I just think that communication is important to have with them on that. You, you meet with us, you have met with them, right? We're going to meet with them. Um, I, I, it's, we will meet with them. We'll meet with them on Monday, <laughs> yes. This coming yeah. Monday. Do you need anybody with, I mean, I don't, I'm not, but I mean, you. No, nope, it's just the exec team. Just the exec team with a couple of county commissioners? I don't. I don't believe there's any commissioner. Oh, you're just meeting with. Uh, but the the county commissioners have asked that or agreed that their exec team or whatever they call their teams and financial people will do a roundtable or whatever. Uh, their budget officer reached out to us and um, asked. Yes. It happens every year. It's not. It's not new. It's. It's just. It's good to have that open communication with them on that. Is, is there anything else I can provide for you? Any more detail? No, that's great. Thank you. And then post any questions online too, because I'll, I'll check too. I, I think I think one of the things we have, you know, we, we got a couple of different scenarios in here, and like you said, some of this is placeholding issues. So um, we're in a little bit of limbo until we get a little bit more information down the road on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Towers. Okay, and that's current action items. Dash four, dash oh one, therapy travelers. That is all, Miss Bass. You're telling me that uh, that position has been filled, and we'll look at it, or you'll be, as the usual, looking to hire to fill that gap there. Okay. Uh, dash four, dash oh two, clay target team at Kent Island High School. Uh, we've had discussion on this. Uh, put some stuff out for information for the public. Um, does any members have any more comments on that or proposals? Well, I have a proposal. Um, I move that the board approve creation of a QACPS clay target team sports program in affiliation with the USA and Maryland State High School Clay Target League and that the superintendent and her team finish their work on completing the necessary documents and other steps to implement this action as soon as possible, but no later than the Maryland League's fall 2021 season. And a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do I have any discussion or any questions? So this would be uh, to ask or direct the superintendent to move forward with this with information and fill in the gaps that are needed to move the proposal forward. I had a couple things just because I, I was able to speak to um, Josh, who is the state coordinator for Maryland. And you know, it's what's wonderful about it, they said that 39% of the athletes, the, the uh, league athletes, are not involved in any other activity. And uh, 19 years, never had an incident. And I love that it's co ed and adaptive. He was telling me that there's a couple people on his team that um, two of them are in wheelchairs and one is missing a leg, and his father is participating and helping him with that stuff. But um, they have currently, they were going to be on target in 2020 to even increase more, but they currently have 
32,000, almost 33,000 participants on 1,042 teams in 25 states in 2019. That's pretty impressive. And you know, and just I know that our parents wanted it because it was such a large um, interest when they had it last year, the people that signed up to be interested in it. And you know, once again, just wanting to give our parents um, options, especially because we're losing a lot of our sports leagues because of COVID. It's just one other option for them um, moving forward. So. Okay, Andy. Just something very quickly. I noticed in the motion that it was for the Queen Anne's County Clay Target League. It was my understanding that we have to be tied by the U.S. Clay Target League specifically to one school. school so yes. I'm thinking that yes. at this point it has to be the Kent Island High School. Not that that would necessarily preclude students from anywhere else, but I think that sponsorship is what's actually tying us to that league. We can check in on that and see No, I think that's... that you're right. Thank okay. you for that. Yes, I believe oh, that you're okay. right. So uh, would you like to... Restate your motion. Yes, um, I, I would I'd, restate I'd make it. it clear that it, if it's Ken Island, it would would it still be for the whole available to the whole county? Yes, and I think that was the intent, and that's something else that could be included within that motion. Um, I just yeah, uh, yeah I you. think I think we have to be tied specifically to Ken Island High School. Okay, uh, okay. We, we have we have a motion on the floor, so uh, let's take a vote on that, which. Uh, do a roll call because we're going to have to put that Still down. Discussion. Right. We've had discussion. And we're, no, we're, I'm not. Well, then I need to make it. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. More discussion. <laughs> fine. I'm sorry. No. So let's be clear. Are you proposing that this clay target team be designated as a sport? Yes. You are. Well, I yes. Mean yes. 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 Colin, but yes. It's her motion. Yeah. Because if you are, then there are regulations, there are procedures that you have to follow if that's the case. Um, first, I, I do have a couple of things that I want to say. One, uh, I want to be sure that you are understanding, and I know that you have your attorney here, and online for those who are watching from home, we have Ms. Kia Chandler, who is the uh, legal counsel for the superintendent and our team. Um, she is standing by, and she's been working with us on this as well, and your attorney is here, so that's good. So I just want to be sure that what you're proposing is that you understand that what you're proposing is wrong on several levels. Um, one, you're acting contrary to your own board policy, 524, which states that the superintendent or designee shall approve all student organizations, both school sponsored and non-school sponsored within the school system. Two, MABE, our insurance carrier, has openly stated their opposition to this club, not once but twice, and you're aware of that. The Clay Target team has not met the insurance requirement requested by MABE. Four, while it's absolutely within the board's authority to set and control school system policy, there is clearly established policy centered on the development of a policy. And if you're going to change a policy, there are procedures for that. Five, if your argument is that, which you did confirm, that the clay target team is a sport, your thinking um, is erroneous. The USA High School Clay Target League clearly states that the high school, at the high school level, it's an activity or a club. It is not a sanctioned, sanctioned as a sport in Maryland with the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association. If you want it to be considered um, as a sport, by MPSSAA, approval from them is required, and as you know, that there are procedures for that. Um, and then there has to be some level of agreement across the state as to interest. Six, you're not following the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Athletic Handbook, which includes a protocol for adding sports. Among the 10 clearly defined uh, requirements for adding a sport, I can, I can certainly share a few. And, and among other things, there has to be um, parents, and of course there's an interest survey that has to happen, uh, community members, athletic directors and administrators. Um, and, and given we haven't 
formally ask the principal, but it, I'm assuming that the principal is in support of it, assuming that he's in support of it. If the majority of the principal's athletic director and the superintendent or designee support the exploration of interest in the proposed sport, the evaluation process will continue. Five, a student athlete survey will be administered to evaluate interest regarding participation in the recommended sport. Information gathered via the interest survey will be shared with the superintendent, high school principals, and athletic directors for review. The survey must reflect that a school is able to field a competitive squad relative to the number of participants involved in the recommended sport. The supervisor of athletics will review the interest survey as well as the discussion of the high school principals and athletic directors make a recommendation to the superintendent to either move the proposal forward to the board for further evaluation or stop at the proposal due to lack of interest. And then if the decision is made to move the proposal onto the board, the superintendent and the supervisor of athletics will present the recommendation. I can go on and on, but I just wanna be sure that the public is aware and that you're aware since we all have our legal counsel with us advising us that you are defying your own policies, you're going to against your own policies. This is yet another attempt to usurp my authority, uh, to marginalize me publicly, take my authority, do whatever it is that you wanna do with it, and make up your own rules. And it's ridiculous. And it really does need to stop. Well, Dr. Kane, what, I, don't, I don't think we're trying to assert your authority. We're trying to work with you. I think the board will find out if the majority wants to do it or not by vote. but would like to see, it's been motioned and brought forward to move this forward. Uh, th there is things that have to be done. I don't think, um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of this in the past, had information. Maybe from the, from the email that Carla sent us on February the 17th, risky business, but they also gave some things that we should have a league policy and hold harmless and some different things that should be done. And that's things that needs to be worked out that, that, that you could take and move forward with it. Uh, and I understand that, that you are not in favor of this sport, but if the board would like to see it in Queen Anne's County, we would like them to see it move forward. And there's a lot of details that need to be worked out. And um, I have no problem being reasonable and giving some time to do that, but um, I think that's some of the issue we have. And that's just my opinion, but the rest of the board can speak for themselves. We have to stop with the opinions. We have policies and procedures for a reason. That they're there for a reason, and this board is ignoring them. So not I'd like about to an say, opinion, but it's about what we are required or not required to do. Okay, so the protocol that you're referring to is the uh, athletic uh, handbook. <clears throat> and uh, the first protocol is that, you know, the, we want this added to the MPSSAA. So we don't have to do that right now, you know, address the MPSSA. That's Why? the first Why step. Why don't you? Well, hang on, that's the first step. So the last step where you stop short is the board has asked for more information regarding the cost, the funds, the insurance, everything else that we, we you got to number eight. Uh, we've been going over this for the last uh, past couple of months. It was started in March of 2020. Um, and then uh, sort of dropped off the radar a little bit. But we're at that point where we've got enough information regarding the costs and insurance and everything else that we are ready to proceed with number nine. The Board of Education will make the final decision for or against the adoption of the new sport to be added to the county uh, athletic program. Um, and then after that, we will deal with the uh, MPSSAA uh, requirements, if any, that are that are needed at that point to proceed. Um, and a new sport will not be created or eliminated until the board makes their decision. So that's where we are tonight. Personally, I think it's a, a great idea. I asked, uh, you know, at a last, I think it was the last meeting or the meeting before, um, and Dr. Kane, you hit it. You know, Queen Anne's County has got its own culture and it is part of our culture. We have some of the best, uh, you know, uh, duck and uh, goose hunting uh, lands in probably this hemisphere, uh, if not the United States. And um, um, shooting is an Olympic sport. You know, there's different sports. This is just one of several Olympic sports that are recognized. It's a, it's a healthy sport. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be in fear of. 
I had asked uh, at a last meeting why you know you were against it because it was it's obvious that you are and, and I respect that uh, I really do um, and uh, and your reason was that you know we have well, I mean, frankly, it was that uh, we're putting the guns in the hands of mentally ill children. So that's not the case. I cannot agree with that. Um, this is not a sport for all the kids in the high school or in the schools, the two high schools. Uh, the parents will make, obviously, the decision, and, uh, and the kids will you know, work with the coach and 4-H is involved, and, and that we know all those details. We've heard them routinely. Um, and uh, and so for those reasons, uh, I'm for it. And it, we need something new and refreshing after what we've been through for the past year, what the kids have been through. And uh, this board advocates, you know, we're here for the kids. We're not here for any other organizations um, for their best interests. Uh, this is, is, as Ms. Bennett has uh, recognized, for in 19 years, there's been no injuries in this sport. There's been more injuries in, in football and other contact sports. Then in this one, and um, so for those reasons, I'm for it. And for those reasons that I mentioned about the handbook, we're at that point where we are within our authorization to make this vote, um, if if we do so, uh, determine to create it, and then we'll deal with MPSSAA requirements as per the protocol. Uh, do you mind, Mr. Burns? Do you have any advice for us? Sure. I, I mean, listening to the conversation. Um, Speak up front and your name and. For the record, uh, Darren Burns, Board Council. Um, I and listened to the discussion. Um, first of all, I want to remind you, just from a parliamentary standpoint, uh, there's a motion on the floor. There was a staff suggestion of a potential, friend, I guess we'll call it a friendly amendment, but there was no friendly amendment suggested. So I just want to remind you, you are in, and Dr. Kane reminds you, in discussion phase, and certainly it's appropriate for the superintendent. In fact, it's their obligation to advise you on a matter that's before you. So just remind yourselves, there is a, a motion pending. It has been seconded, and, and that's what we're talking about. Um, I, with respect to the various authorities, and we'll call them maybe policies that have been thrown around. Um, I've heard mention of, of the, the school clubs, uh, school organizations, excuse me, student organizations or school clubs policy 524. I, I, I've never since I first heard of this program pictured it falling within that, that policy. Uh, I'm not, that's not to say I'm 100% right about these things. I've actually spoken with Ms. Chandler, who Dr. Kane referred to earlier uh, as, as advisor, staff uh, legal advisor, and, and I'm not sure she and I are in 100% agreement, but I think we do agree that that maybe a program like this falls into a bit of a seam. I, I don't think it's a natural fit for the 524 policy. I also not sure it's a fit, at least not yet in time, for anything that's governed by MP uh, SSAA's handbook. If you look at that handbook and the bylaws, I'm not sure you'll find where something described as this motion described and as is the program material seem to describe it fits exactly what's governed by that handbook. Uh, and so then the question when you have something that falls in a gap is, you know, well, then what is it that the board is doing? And as, and as near as I can tell from what board members have said at several meetings and from the research that's been done for, I guess it's been almost a year, is it seems as though, um, as the motion said, it's a proposal to create a new program. I don't think it's a team sport in the sense that's been defined yet. I don't think it's a a, a, a school club, right? It, it's something else. Um, it, it, the fact that it would be at one school but open to both schools makes it somewhat different than most sports. The fact that there aren't other public schools doing it, but there are other schools in Maryland doing it uh, makes it a little bit different. The fact that there are... Um, the fact that there are potentials for co-ed participation as well as adaptive participation also makes it, again, a little bit of an in-betweener. Uh, and so if it comes down to a question of policy, and I know that's Dr. Kane's concern, and I, and I don't see this as, as a, again, uh, as a board versus superintendent issue, it's, it's you have something you're thinking about doing, you think it might be a good policy decision, and your superintendent has advice for you on it, and she's giving it to you. Um, at that 30,000 foot level, you control and you promote your schools and you set policies. If this program you believe is one you think ought to be adopted, 
I think your motion fits within your range of, of what you're allowed to do to start a new program. At the same time, I think you have to respect the details that are involved, especially for something new, to execute it. Uh, I think Ms. Pullen's put plenty of effort into negotiating, so to speak, with Mabe over what those uh, protocols would look like for insurance. I've seen those memos as well. I actually saw the most recent one. It did not seem to me as strong as maybe pre prior ones that suggested don't do this. In fact, there was a caution. I don't want to get into too much risk management detail in public uh, because it borders on, on your control of legal issues. But there was a suggestion that don't forget there's a statutory uh, limit on liability. Don't forget how Mabe's insurance works. Make sure you're working with them. And most importantly, as I recall from the memo is you got to have your contracts and your related documents airtight. And certainly as board counsel, I would work with Ms. Chandler and, and Dr. Kane or anybody else on ensuring that those relationship documents with the league, with the USA League, if you do this, with uh, any state officials that are interested and, and any of your local officials are all in order, right? But those aren't impediments, those aren't legal impediments or policy impediments because you are, you are the policy makers. Um, and so I, if you're asking my opinion, I do not believe that as stated, the motion violates 524 because I don't think that applies. I don't believe it violates your, your MPSSAA, not yours, but the state's MPSSAA bylaws or rules because I don't think it fits neatly with any of their definitions. Uh, lastly, I think that under the athletic handbook, and I scrubbed this thing and I looked as many places as possible, and I could be wrong, and Ms. Chandler, please, we're, we're supposed to be in this together advising our group client here. I could find nothing in that handbook that says that it's board policy. I saw the contributing team. I see who's at least on the 1819, I think it is, uh, version, that it's the athletic directors and the principals of the schools. But that doesn't override board policy. Frankly, it doesn't override superintendent's prerogative or implementation. Um, it's clearly at 70, 69 pages, a well thought out document, but I believe uh, board member Schifanelli just went through a list of items under that handbook that have already been accomplished. And so it, it, if anything, it seems like this is fitting somewhat under your athletic handbook, somewhat under your general policy making. And if you add my opinion of whether or not there's a legal impediment from a law or policy standpoint to the motions on the table, I would say that there is not. Dr. Kane, right, thank you. Thank you. Like to... Yes, um, Ms. Chandler, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay, would you, would you like, thank you for being here first of all. And I'm gonna ask you if you would give your legal opinion with regard to the clay target teams. Sure, for the record, Kia Chan, Chandler, Council for the Superintendent Bull. Can you go ahead? We, we missed what you said. Uh, we heard your introduction, but it was a little choppy toward the end. So could you repeat after your name? We heard your name. Kia Chandler, uh, for the record, for Superintendent Bull. And then I asked, did you hear me? Now we can hear you, yes. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm certainly not here to believe you want to tell the board of the superintendent whether the board um, on this matter. Um, I think for me, whether it's a club or a board, uh, certainly Dan and I have, um, Mr. Barnes and I have spoken about this and we don't agree fully on this. I do agree with that. And that I don't think that is a, it is a sport um, in the true sense of what a sport is. Um, I can understand and see where there would benefits were a sport to us uh, based on the guidance from me. Uh, I would just note one thing that I haven't heard as part of the conversation that the county does have other countywide activities that are similar to this club, such as ice hockey, bowling sailing, equestrian, cycling, and those are all clubs with minimum supervision from community personnel and minimum funding, um, and the coaches aren't paid. How they structured was similar to how we were trying to structure the clay targets team. Um, uh, but I would note that in a more 
and whether we label it as a club or whether it is as a sport, uh, when you note the um, the emails regarding or from me, one of the things that they did talk about was having the legal documents in place. And I have been working with Carla, and I do believe Mr. Burns has seen one of the coaches' agreements, and I also uh, drafted a form for parents. Uh, the main thing that Nave did want the county to have is an MOU U.S. Agency. And it's our understanding, or it's my understanding, as of today, we are not able to secure that. Um, I did speak with Ms. Pullen about that today, and we don't have a definitive no. Um, and I think Ms. Pullen can speak specifically to the information that she got directly from them, but it did not sound that they were likely to enter into an agreement with us that would shift liability. Um, so if we are not able to secure that, then the information that I would provide is that we would have to be strengthening our agreement with the coach. Uh, essentially, you're trying to shift liability there. Um, and as far as the current insurance, I did speak with the as well today, um, and do have one million from the Clay Target League and one million from um, the Ski Club as well as 250,000 for students. Um, but Maeve was recommending that you have 2 million um, from one particular entity. Um, we're not able to get that. So my only other recommendation would be possibly that they should get their own um, insurance. Because one of the things that they have to do is they name us on their policy as an additional insurer which currently right now, I'm not, we're not able to secure that from the play target league. So that's just additional information that I wanted to make sure that the board um, had and knew where we, we were. And I'd like to add, just for a point of clarity, Mr. Burns noted that he wasn't sure. He feels like this is in between play target teams or, or the association identifies them as a club or activity, which therefore makes it fall under policy 525. Another point of clarity, I'd like to ask, what policy are you basing the formation of this team on? You say as a matter of policy. What, what policy is that? Dr. Kane, not, not a capital P policy as in one of the ones that's listed, say, on the board's website. I'm talking about the statutory policy making, small p policy making authority of a board. So they have not, I mean, I know that we've gone over some of these and I heard you make a comment that all of the steps had been taken. Mr. Schifanelli skipped right over to, to nine. We've not gotten through one through eight. And, I, and my comment, Dr. Kane, was that Mr. Schifanelli had mentioned the steps having been taken up. That was, I was commenting about what he had said. I can't, I can't vouch for every step. Because they have moment. not. <laughs> Again, I, I'm not bait, debating those facts. What I'm saying is there's more than just the athletic handbook or the MPSSAA or even policy 524 at play here. It, it just because the national organization calls what they think they do a club or an activity does not mean that's what it is for your county under your policy. And it may not be how your board defines it. And I'm not saying that there's some perfect answer to this. What I'm saying is it seems to me that there's been a, pro a process over the last year of approaching this as if it's something under athletic handbook. That athletic handbook does, as Mr. Schiaffinelli pointed out, state in it that it's the board's final call on whether to implement this program or not. And to say that, the, and, and since they, the handbook is not a policy, it's not a regulation even, and it's certainly not a law, the board can always do something that's different than what's in this handbook, because this wasn't adopted by the board. No, it was not adopted by the board, but it does govern the way we do athletics here. And the fact of that this is not a sport, because Clay Target Teams says it is not a sport at the high school level, 
if we're creating something brand new, then there's a procedure for that. That's why we have the athletic. If you're trying to create a sport, that's why we have this handbook to govern how it happens. And I don't disagree with that, Dr. King. In fact, I, I, I'd be the first one to tell you that you can't rush in, especially if you're breaking new ground. If there's an overall policy decision to move forward with something like this, I'm right there with uh, Ms. Chandler and you in saying that there's a lot of T's to cross and a lot of I's to dot. And, and again, that's separate from whether or not someone thinks it ought to happen. I'm just saying, I agree that there are steps to be taken before you can get there. But I think that's separate from the overarching question or decision from the board to let's move forward. This happens in a lot of areas, and I don't think it's something that has to be a either or decision. If they wanted to move ahead and ask that it move ahead and approve to move ahead, that doesn't mean it can move ahead tomorrow. And, and, and Ms. Chandler's referring to, for instance, I only know what stuff is shared with me or what's forwarded to me, just like the board does. If Ms. Chandler's had conversations specifically about any insurance policies with anybody, I still have to catch up to that. And, and, and I'm sure that she will catch me up to it. But those are details. If, and and it, may be, it may be that at some point in time, you come back with council, with me, with staff, who knows, and say, here's where we got to, and here's our roadblock. And we can't figure out a way around the roadblock. And maybe new, we had to put our heads around it. But that's, I don't think that's where you are today. I think we're still negotiating and talking about it. And so that's why I can't say there's a legal impediment to the board approving that this program move forward. I can only say that I agree that it, it's not something that can happen quickly. I can tell you that when we don't go through the processes, because we haven't, in order to get to the place where the board gives approval for it, it has to come through the person who sits in the seat for the superintendent. Right? That is what is outlined here. That is what is outlined in the policy, whether you agree to it or not, that's the policy. The board has the authority to change the policy. If the board wants to change the policy, then they have procedures that they go through to change the policy. What is happening right now is we're skipping A to get to B. And I do think that is more than just having a conversation. If this board is empowered today to make a, to vote, to do something that they don't have the authority to do at this point, Point, then we are stepping over a whole lot of, uh, of governance that this board should be responsible for. And I will, I will take it to the state board and ask for a declaratory ruling because if it is about being a sport, it is not. If it is about being a club or an activity, it is under my authority. Under your authority, under your, and just so I'm clear on this, because I want to make sure we're all speaking on the same uh, on the same sheet. Uh, you mean it's under your authority as set forth in Policy 524? Correct. Okay, because because I don't think the handbook, which also we keep referring to, which is separate from that policy, that doesn't override board authority. No, the hand, the handbook. No, I'm not saying that the handbook. The handbook sets the protocol for how you establish a new sport, and they've not done that. So what's the point in having this they, they, if, if, they, they, if they aren't going to follow it? The policy talks about who has the authority to ordain or, or not clubs and activities, student-sponsored organizations. That's the superintendent. So it does make a difference if the vote is cast tonight. It does. But that assumes that this fits within 524. And I think reasonable minds can have disagreements on this. I don't believe that what's been described in this program appears to fit under 524. They That's say my opinion. They, the, the clay targets team, they call themselves a club or activity. That doesn't mean it fits this school system. So are they, if they are creating something new, that goes back to it. If they are creating something new that they call a sport, there is a protocol for adding a sport. Under the handbook, you're saying. That is correct. And what I'm saying, my advice to the board, Dr. Kane, and therefore to you, is that the board isn't bound to do everything in that handbook if it chooses in a public meeting to make an exception to that handbook. It's not even a policy. It's, it's not a policy. It it's it's a somebody policy. created a document, and again, I don't have its pedigree. I don't know when it was created. I only know that there's nothing in it that says it constitutes board's policy. It's not, it, it doesn't have your signature that say it's the regulation. It, it looks like it was crafted by staff doing a great job coming up with procedures. The board still has the ability 
ability to pass a decision that changes what's in this handbook. That's, that's my advice. That's why I go back. It's simply there is no legal impediment, I believe, under 524 or the handbook or any authority that I've been able to find for the board passing a motion like the one I heard tonight. Again, I have my reservations about how it can move forward without a lot of details being done. But Procedures but and regulations and operations of the school district fall under the authority of the superintendent. That's a different the issue. The, and that is what this is. And the board handles policy. It's not a policy, so why are they there? Why are they in that? And if we're going to pick and choose about what the board can and cannot do, then we're being absolutely frivolous. Uh, there's no picking and choosing, and I would never want the public record to misconstrue that. And I don't believe this is a battle between, uh, and this is not the first time I've heard this tonight, uh, some sort of purview war between the board and the superintendent. The state law says, whether it's 4101 you look at, or 4108 the education article, or any of the authorities that come from them, it says that the board controls matters pertaining to the educational programs, and it sets policy. Policy. Small P policy. Policy. And. Policy. This is not, this is not, this is, this is not a policy. Again, this is a definitional issue. Policy is the principles that drive the school system's operation. And and some of those principles, would you agree, are regulations and procedures that fall under the purview of the superintendent? I believe the superintendent can adopt regulations. Yes or no? Excuse me. Go for it. Go ahead. I believe that the law is pretty clear that the superintendent's authority is day-to-day -day operation of school system, including the implementation of board policy. Which means regulations, procedures. Implementing board policy, correct. Correct, which this is not a board policy. But the board wants to make a decision tonight, is what I hear, which would then create a policy decision to be implemented. That's what I hear. It's not. I don't see this as a battle. I see it as an interest in a program. I, I see. I see. I see it as we need a higher authority to make a decision for us. Because if it's a sport, we have procedures set up, and it absolutely does, in my opinion, seem to be pick and choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Skip over all of the other things, but I'm going to go straight to let the board approve it without all the other things having been done. That's what it is. That's what's happening tonight, and there's no disputing it. Well, I don't think the board, the board is trying to set this up so it can move forward. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with you and your staff support. And then it will make decisions once we find out if it's going to be able to be feasibly implemented. But if, it, you know, the question is the board wants this at this time, we'll find out if, if we vote on it to move it forward. That's what we're trying to do. I hear you. I hear you. And you aren't hearing me. I hear you say the board wants to move it forward. If the board has made a motion. I, but the if, superintendent if, did not. So that's just where we are. That That is where we are. And that's where we are. The board's made a motion. Okay, the, 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 the board's made a motion discussion. seconded, and we've had some discussion. Is there any more discussion right now? Because do we need to amend that? No, no. We're, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me to, finish this, Mark. Oh, sure. First, is there any more discussion with Dr. Kane or staff? I, I vehemently disagree. Okay, I understand that. that sounded. Okay, we have a motion, but we've also had uh, a friendly thing, a motion or a amendment to the motion. We can either uh, vote it down and add or whatever the board wants to do at their discretion um, to make sure it's clear that even if it's Ken Island and we've used this terminology sponsored or been in Queen Anne's County, Ken Island High School, it would be open to the whole system, both Queen Anne's County High School and Ken Island High School. Um, Mr. Smith, point of order, while there's been all that discussion, I, I think from, again, from parliamentary standpoint, there's only one motion on the floor and there was no, Friendly amendment, sort of a term of art. But there was no, there was no amendment, no secondary amendment that was seconded and approved. So the board's motion that remains on the floor is still the original motion. Let's let's, let's vote on you that. You may right. wish to have that reread into the record too, mm -hmm. if if it's available. I, it's either that or your clerk would have to. Read. Yeah, I've done a few crosses out there. But the original. Oh, you have to add the, your original motion. It's, it's the original the motion. motion stated. I move that the board approve creation of the QACPS Clay Target Team Sport Program in affiliation with the USA and Maryland State High School Clay Target League, and that the superintendent and her team finish their work on completing the necessary documents and other steps to implement this action ASAP, but no later than the Maryland League's fall 2021 season. That's the original motion. Okay. And your second was uh, someone seconded, I believe. I seconded it. Okay. 
And that, that does that, that's for discussion, does that allow, everybody understands it's Queen Anne's too? Or is that not clear enough? Well, we're going to make, I think I was going to do an amendment after. Okay, let's, let's vote on this one right now. Can you call it Mrs. Uh, okay, Rice? Sure. Mr. Spinelli? Yes. Bennett? No, not as it stands. No. No. No, okay. So I, at this point, just because I'm still new to this, I move to make a different motion. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. I move that the board approve creation of the Kent Island High School Clay Target Team Program in affiliation with the USA and Maryland State High School Clay Target League, and that the superintendent and her team finish their work on completing the necessary documents and other steps to implement this action ASAP, but no later than the Maryland League's fall 2021 season, and understanding that though it's labeled Kent Island High School, it would also include high school students from Queen Anne's County High School. Second. A motion. Second. Any discussion? Queen Anne, sir. I hear any further discussion? No. Ms. Wright, please call for the... Mr. Chippenelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have three of the affirmative. It passes. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Chandler. Yeah, thank you for thank your time. Thank you. Everybody, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, we have uh, future meetings. Uh, March the 3rd would be our regular board meeting. Uh, then we have March the 10th and 17th, currently scheduled for budget, work, budget workshops, which um, definitely will be on, and there would be an open 24th. We'll discuss that later. Do I hear any other uh, things for the calls? Dr. Kane? Any other items you want to, before we close the meeting? No. Any other board members, any? No, sir. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously, 3-0. Three, three, oh. Thank you. All right, thanks. Everybody.